All right, so it's lecture eight. We're in the bioenergy chapter. We're very fortunate that we have Patrick Brown here of International Biomass. And what he's done uh, in the last couple minutes was demonstrate, uh, well, started an experiment in the classroom. So he's got one of his products uh, here. This is hog fuel. It, it's a, is it a 90-10 mix? Is that about right, yeah. uh, Patrick? So 90% wood, 10% uh, plastic. You can see it's, it's floating there at the top. About an, uh, one inch in diameter, what's the total? One inch diameter. One inch diameter. Mm -hmm. and, and it's about right now, it's about an inch and a half in, in length because I broke it in half. Right. And then in, this, in the second jar, I think they're already starting to degrade, but these are your sort of uh, commercially, you know, currently commercially available wood pellets. And I won't. And you can get it at any hardware store. Right. And so let me, um, I'll set these aside. And then are you ready just to kind of do your thing on the laptop? Yeah. Thanks. So before you, uh, when we started uh, chatting here, what yeah. I, uh, is that the, the definition of renewable energy yeah. and uh, what it is that uh, we as uh, biomass manufacturers give a bad rap. Can you stay close to the mic? Yeah, perfect. That's right um, it gets a bad rap. Yeah. And uh, because it's not sexy. I think that's the, the terminology that best describes it. Windmills go around and everybody likes the prettiness of a windmill. Right. Uh, the uh, solar panels are blue and uh, you know they can see them. Right. On the off day when the wind isn't blowing and the sun isn't shining, they don't produce energy. Right. Biomass produces energy 365 days out of the year. Yeah. Okay. And so uh, the, the fuel that I just uh, demonstrated, the pellets, there's nothing sexy about them. They're a right. piece of wood that looks like a salted nut roll, and sometimes people call them other names, and we won't go into that either, but that's the, that's the bottom line is, is that. But the robustness of the pellets, whether it's the six millimeter pellets or it's the, uh, uh, our, what we call our tiger pellet, just because it, it is uh, robust, it's 10,500 BTU, six millimeters and 8,000 BTU. Uh, it is durable for transportation, which is very important uh, because we want to either put it on the rail or we want to put it on um, uh, in a truck uh, and we want to put it in bulk. The six millimeter bags, all or, or pellets, all have to be in plastic bags. There's just no getting around it. They've tried to put it into uh, the super sacks, you know, the big uh, white sacks that are about so tall. Mm -hmm. The problem is, is that uh, they're not waterproof enough. And so uh, what happens in that waterproofing uh, process is, is that, uh, you know, within minutes of, the, of it happening, mm -hmm. look what happens. Yeah. We now have mush. So, so the mush yeah, is that uh, is working so that it uh, doesn't, you know, it, for, if you're the customer, what are you going to do? You end up with that. And the ships that are going to Europe out of the uh, East Coast they're getting better at uh, sealing off theirs, but uh, they're losing up to 20% of their uh, pellets because they're still using the six millimeter pellet in the hull of a ship. Well, the hull of a ship gets the water in it. Mm -hmm. And uh, so uh, they, they lose a fair amount of their, uh, of their product, and that has to be deducted off of the, the obvious price. Both of these products probably go through a drying process prior to, to pellet formation. Is yeah, so I'll, I'll step you through that, yeah. uh, that process. Yeah. So in ours, we take and uh, we, we look at ourselves as a factory, not as a mill. The pellet the ones in the six millimeter come across as a, uh, uh, as a pellet mill. And uh, because basically they're taking debarked wood, chipping it, and then making the pellets and, and extruding the water from it, uh, have, having the water a little bit as a, as a binder, if you will. Ours is just the opposite. We put ours into a dryer goes uh, through a drying system down to 10% moisture, and then it goes through our uh, patented process that takes that same uh, uh, wood, and then we use a, a resin, and that resin is recycle number twos and fours. Our story is, is that we want to eradicate plastic from the landfills in the Pacific Northwest, and maybe even further, you know, as we, as we grow. But we'll, we'll, stay, we'll stay small, you know, because the Pacific Northwest is so small. And uh, <clears throat> so the whole idea there is, is that when it goes through our process, we take and uh, heat up the wood and the plastic to over 400 degrees. 
they uh, melt together and then they come out to be that nice solid piece of pellet. And uh, so we use dryers. The uh, industry doesn't. I think they should, but that's that, that's it's a cost. But sure. we build in that cost because that cost to us will give us a, a higher resale uh, uh, value on, on that. And so the resin does give it the bump uh, in the in the product, but it also gives it the resiliency and the durability. And we'll uh, you know we'll just uh, give that a. Uh, <laughs> The Luxie, and that Luxie is, is that uh, this is the uh, one, and this is the IBM G pellet, and same amount of time, and it's still there, and you guys keep this throughout the semester, okay. and keep a look at it, and it'll still it make uh, a little bit of the ligand will come out with color uh, to it, but that's about it. So this is the opportunity uh, for it. Um, the uh, We did ligand last week, remember? Yeah, they come up again. Big giant molecule. Bioenergy. I think that was Tuesday. I missed Tuesday. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we, we looked at uh, photosystem one, too. I just remember looking at a few molecular structures. Cellulose, ligand, yeah. and photosystem one. So, I'm going to give you the the, the shortcut to, to how to uh, manufacture. Yeah. I need these five items on the uh, on the list in order to build uh, a pellet uh, factory. Any one of those is gone. I can't do it. There, there are five uh, criteria. Uh, the bank looks at it. Uh, investors, you know, whoever you're talking about in order to raise the money to, to do it. So you can have the best product in the world that we have with the pellets, but if you don't have this all put together, uh, then it, it, it makes no difference. And uh, I've been after this for four and a half years. My business partner is a logger, so he has to stay up uh, working, uh, logging uh, to, uh, to keep going. And I've been pushing the drive to keep our company going and finding these five uh, opportunities to build a plan. Uh, the transportation logistics uh, are fairly straightforward. It's incoming and outgoing. So the loggers need to be able to come into our uh, physical plant, be able to unload the logs, and uh, we need to uh, be able to process them. After they're processed into the next looking pellets, they have to go somewhere and uh, to that end user. And how is that going to happen? Is it going to happen by trucking or is it going to happen uh, by rail? And so in our case, uh, we have to have everything by by rail, and uh, because uh, when we manufacture, we uh, manufacture 10,000 tons a month, and the reason that uh, that number is is that Burlington Northern uh, is the one who dictates how much quantity that they'll allow me to ship every month. And that's a, is that a minimum 10,000 tons a month? No, a it's not. Okay, but economics it is. Yeah. Uh, others have tried to do you know five or six uh, cars. We need to do 100 cars because when it gets to the uh, port, if we're going to ship it uh, on an export, the minimum that the ship will take is 10,000 tons. Mm -hmm. yeah. And they don't like that. They would rather us to have 20,000 or even 30,000 tons because the, the scale of the economics keep working itself down the more volume that you have into the process. Mm -hmm. So with that, uh, we can do trucking. But the trucking has to be really a small goat into the uh, manufacturing plant and so that uh, uh, enough semis can make enough trips to keep the boiler system activated. When the university was looking at that, they were looking at uh, bringing in eight truckloads a day. Mm -hmm. And uh, so uh, we need that kind of that donut uh, to be within like 100 miles mm -hmm. so that they can burn and turn. Do you, do you have an approximate sort of do uh, dollar per ton in getting wood out of the forest? You know, the yeah. Handle on that? Yeah. It's going to vary, uh, but right now I know that out in Bonner, uh, they pay between $28 and $32 a ton. Mm -hmm. That's mainly for logs coming out. Yeah. Right, okay. Yeah. And that's what we're going to use. If there's some in woods chipping, yeah. uh, that's better for us. We'll pay more because that means that we don't have to chip it. Yeah. And so we give them the, uh, the that value uh, and uh, that ease for us uh, type of a thing. 
So inward shipping is really uh, nice because that means that uh, the logs uh, and everything else has already been processed for us and all we have to do is put it in a pile, dry it, and uh, we're ready to uh, make as opposed to us taking a whole log, putting it through our chipper, sending it into a, another pile. And uh, so it, it's, it's really a, a nice part for us. Are they shipping it to a standard size that matches what size you're shipping yeah, to? Yeah, we, we, yeah. Yeah, we, we ask them that if they're going to be our vendor, that they do a quarter inch minus screen. And uh, that works out best for us because you can see by the, the chunks in, in our pellets there is that we can take a little bit uh, bigger where that six millimeter pellet uh, that you saw there is, is that it goes into a chip. So right, everybody knows what uh, a wood chip looks like, right? And so that wood chip then uh, takes and goes through a hammer mill and gets crushed down to like a sawmill or a sawdust uh, substance, and then that's what they squeeze together. Well, that takes one more step through the process where we don't need to go through that process. We just need to do the quarter inch lines, and so uh, that helps us out in. Uh, energy savings and uh, uh, equipment and, uh, you know, quite frankly, safety. You know, those hammer mills are, uh, they're, they're built for a reason. They pound a good uh, wood chip into a, uh, into a little fine powder. So anyhow, that's, that's, the, the, that's the logistics of bringing it in and taking it out. And so uh, um, I put that as number one because really, if you don't have incoming and you don't have a place uh, for it, it really, you know, it, it doesn't matter. You have the Taj Mahal of, uh, of pellet uh, factories in it, it wouldn't work. The next one is the fiber supply. And obviously, uh, us living in Montana, we look around everywhere we have, and we have wood uh, supply. Here's the thing. The question is asked of me, uh, you know, once every day, why aren't we going to build a pellet mill here in, in Missoula? And uh, there's lots of factors. And those factors are is that 80% of the uh, fiber supply that is in within a, the greater 70 mile donut in Missoula is owned by the federal government. Only 20% of it's private. We go down the road 120 miles to Helena, it's the exact flop. 70% private, 30% uh, uh, government owned uh, wood. And so the problematics of that economics is, is that you can't get the Forest Service, you have to go through so much to get a Forest Service sale. And then even if you get awarded the sale, you still may have to wait another five years to go through the litigation that it's going to go through. That puts us out of business. We need to have that uh, source uh, of the supply all the time. We can't rely on maybe now. But that said, if the Forest Service the DNRC ever came up, mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and all of a sudden wood came into our, it would just be a bonus to us. We would keep it as a bonus, we'd uh, save it for a rainy day, but we know that it's not necessarily going to be helpful for us. So that's why I put that as number two. Don't have the wood, we're kind of out of the, out of the business. Uh, three, power. So. Because Montana was never developed into an industrial uh, state, the lack of power in our state for large operations is very small. The Bonner plant, Smurf at Stone, and a couple of other places around the state are the only ones that had large enough electric capacity to run uh, the big motors that it takes to run a factory. And so it's really problematic. And uh, in Helena, you know, Northwestern Energy, you know, God bless their soul, but man, they treated us like, you know, uh, dog doo-doo, and it was really problematic because they wanted us to run five, five miles, four, four and a half miles of new power lines, and uh, which we had to pay for. The uh, substation it only it was a two megawatt, two point two megawatt. They, uh, we needed eleven, so they were going to be able to fifteen, and but they wanted us to pay for that as well. And so, you know, the, the prices just kept escalating on us. And, uh, and then at the end of the day, we still had to pay our power bill. And our monthly power bill was going to be roughly about $300,000 a month. And uh, so, uh, so we started looking at alternatives. Back when we started looking at biomass uh, uh, plants uh, to uh, using our own products, 
uh, producing our own power. The, the cost of uh, that was about $10 million a megawatt. Today, it's down to about $2 million a megawatt, and I would say within the next uh, two to three years, we'll see it uh, drop below a million dollars a megawatt. But we're not quite there yet. So that means that we have another CapEx expense. I need 11 megawatts, so I even at $2 million, I've got $22 million, million that I have to put up. And, mm -hmm. and, you know, just yeah. like that, right? Yeah. So incomes, we'll, uh, you know, we did a little studying on it. We bring in two CAT choruses that put out 5.5 megawatts a piece. They run off of natural gas. And our natural gas bill is only a million five, or at least payment on our on those two uh, gen sets is uh, roughly about uh, 20 grand a month, type of thing. Now I'm only at 170. That's a huge number. It's a big, big number uh, in savings and it goes towards the bottom line. So you basically go off grid with the gen sets, basically. Kind of, yeah. does, the, does the is the gas you're on a gas line though, right? Yeah, you have a natural gas line that's yeah. running into our facility, mm -hmm. and the infrastructure cost on that was only one hundred eighty-seven thousand. Mm -hmm. So you you start you start putting your calculator out, and I'm, I'm I'm running through each and one of these numbers because it all have it all has a number uh, assigned to it, and they're not small numbers, and so that's why. You know, you don't see a pillow mill uh, popping up on every corner. Just spot one. So that answers the question on power. Now, where we go, wherever we go in the United States, like in New Mexico, we're looking at putting a pellet plant or two in New Mexico, and they have relatively inexpensive power. Uh, they have, but they are a little bit more industrial, and so we may or may not have to bring in the gen sets. Uh, we may uh, not need to uh, do, or we may be able to afford. Uh, some biomass power down there and do half and half. So there, there, there's there's new things that are happening so that we can do that. The fourth one is the infrastructure. And that infrastructure is, is that I gotta tell you, it's, it's, a, it's a real uh, problematic because there's not that many rail sightings in, in any state. They've either been torn out because they haven't been used in years. And so you have to find a location that's wrong the, the rail line. And then once you go into the rail line, is, is that you have to go through permitting process with, with BNSF. You have to get regulatory uh, uh, opportunities that, uh, that may not have existed for someone, but maybe will do for us because of uh, the volume you're trying to move. We need about 25 to 30 acres. 30 acres gives us a, a, some breathing room, 20 to 25. It just makes it a little bit tight, especially if we can find inventory sometimes that is at a, a lesser price than that price that I told you to be coming. And uh, <clears throat> so it's nice to have, to be able to take excess inventory and be able to, uh, to pile up. And so our building is about a 30,000 square foot building, uh, pretty simple, uh, but it's the components that are inside of it, that's, the, that's where the brains are. We have, it's all touched in one person runs the entire uh, facility. Got 12 screens up in front of him that uh, is watching everything that's going on. He's got another set of screens here that he's uh, touching to bring in the wood and the, uh, the resin and uh, watching the pellets. And he's got a bomb calometer. He, he's the guy or girl. And uh, so uh, they're running that. And then you got a guy that's out now uh, unloading the, uh, the trucks. You've got uh, the, uh, the different uh, people that are running the, uh, the resin recycling uh, part of our, our process. So. On any given shift, you've got about 12 people during the daytime and then about uh, six of the people in the evening time uh, for the night shift. Uh, you know, we're playing with the, uh, the 12s, uh, mm -hmm. our days, uh, you know, they do uh, three, three on and, and six off type of a thing. So that it's kind of a nice working. Um, we tried playing with the three eights that didn't seem to work out so much because it got a lot of our expenses, you know, personnel. So there's lots of things to consider there. Uh, but especially when you're running 24-7, you know, we might take Christmas off, but it's really, you know, questionable at this point. So and this, and this is describing what's happening in Wisconsin. No, what we're doing is we're taking Wisconsin and putting it on steroids. I got gotcha. you. And okay. uh, they only have one customer, and that one customer, they meet the demands uh, by running uh, uh, five tens. Mm. Uh, so uh, uh, they make enough to, to get them through the, uh, the weekend. Okay. And uh, so... Um, 
but that's their only customer. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, and they share the same parking lot, so they don't have trans, they don't have a transportation. Oh wow. Uh, okay. You know, so when you don't have to go 300 feet, I can afford a lot of diesel mm -hmm. to run it back and forth. Mm -hmm. In fact, that would mean I'd be putting in a conveyor system, but that's just mm -hmm. me. <laughs> you know, to, to automate it. And, uh, and and let me since you brought it up. Yeah. The one in Wisconsin is our R&D facility as well. It's the very first one, and uh, so we're now into, uh, as far as design is concerned with our engineers, we're already into uh, third, maybe fourth uh, generation. Um, they, uh, when, when the pellet uh, mill, or when the pellets are made, pellets come off of a conveyor system and they go into this big eight yard uh, holding tank that has some fans that, uh, that cool it. Our facility, with the design that I, uh, that I came up with, is that we'll have a 65 to 100 foot uh, conveyor system that's a great uh, conveyor system with uh, an air conditioning system on it. And uh, it'll go through there and it'll cool it in 60 seconds as opposed to 20 minutes. Big difference. Big difference. So all we have to do is get it from the 200 degrees that it comes out of the extruders at down to less than 100 degrees. And uh, so we're moving. They're moving uh, 60 tons a, a day. We're moving 384 tons a day. So that's is the is the cooling required so that it maintains its shape? Uh, not only the shape, uh, but it's uh, so that it solidifies. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the cooling actually uh, acts as a part of the, uh, the breakdown of the uh, of it because once that uh, uh, the resin uh, cools down. The, the liquidation of it, 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 everything starts to, the wood becomes impregnant, it becomes pregnant, you know, and uh, that's what holds it together. Yeah. yeah, so, and then this one could actually go to the very top, and uh, because uh, it's, it's probably uh, what I work on uh, 12 hours a day, either, even when I'm not working on it, I'm working on it in my mind, it just drives me, you know, right up the wall because. When we first started out, the industry was blossoming. I mean, it's just expanding like crazy. And uh, uh, Europe was, uh, they couldn't get enough, and uh, we couldn't make it happen in Montana because the logistics goes back to number one. So we can't uh, ship out of Montana. The closest port for us was Houston. The burn and turn on a rail car or uh, an entire unit train to Houston is 22 days. And, uh, and that is if there's no problems. So 11 uh, days down, two days uh, to do, and then the empty one's coming back, 22 days. I can burn and turn out of, uh, out of the port of Longview in, uh, in Washington in, uh, in a bad day, 14 days, and a good day, uh, and a good month, 11. I'm surprised it's that long even out, out here, though. Is it, is it um, traffic? traffic. Really? Just traffic. Because huh. you're competing with everything. You're competing with grain, you're competing with coal, you're competing with oil, you name it. You're, yeah. you're just competing with rail, uh, with rail line. Hmm. And uh, so that's just the nature of the beast. Mm -hmm. And it's the same way of going down to the Port of Houston. As soon as you leave it out of, the, out of southern Montana and uh, eastern Montana, you start you know, getting into grain, you start getting into coal, and, hmm. you know, getting into oil. I mean, it just, you know, you know it just, that's the logistics. That's surprising to me. Yeah, I, was, I mean, we have a lot of trains come through Missoula, but I don't, I don't, it's like, I don't perceive it as congested. But it, it, it is because you don't see all the amount of stuff that's sitting uh, in Butte and Livingston and uh, Billings and uh, you know across the High Line and, and the High Line now. You know, they just finished five hundred and forty million dollars of upgrades of uh, putting in new track, uh, additional track to move a product, and so it's. It's working that way. Yeah, I'm just going to take a quick pause. Did you, you cut on the slide, right? I was going to go to my next slide. Yeah, perfect. Just, we kind of chunk it out in little 30-minute chunks, so I'll just... That's perfect right there.